Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Martin Ivanovsky. I'm field application engineer at Kemet for Central Europe, and I will moderate this webinar today. We are very pleased that you find the time to join our webinar. Uh, the topic of today's webinar is a solution for EMI filtering, and the presenter is Atilio Zucara, our field application engineer for South Europe. With this information, I hand over to Atilio. Hello, Atilio. Thank you for your time today. Please tell us a little about yourself before you begin with the topic. Hello, Martin. Thank you very much. This is, uh, this is a start into a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Attilio Zucano, and I am the field application engineer in uh, IAGEO Group for uh, South Europe. Um, I joined the yeah, IAGEO yeah, CAMET uh, in 2017. So I have more than uh, three years of experience as an FIE for passive components. Previously, I worked for uh, an aerospace defense company based here in Italy as a hardware engineer. Um, this is the training uh, agenda of uh, today's training. Um, we will start with the basics and general requirements for EMC. Then we will uh, talk about uh, EMI capacitors, KHB tests and requirements. After that, uh, we will switch to uh, common mode and differential chokes, uh, the relation between inductance and impedance, and finally, we will quickly uh, talk about dual mode chokes. Okay, so EMC, electromagnetic compatibility, is a big word. Um, how can we define it? EMC is the ability of electrical equipment and systems to work good in their electromagnetic environment by limiting the intentional generation, propagation, and reception of electromagnetic energy. There are international standards uh, and national standards organizations as, for example, IEC, EN, FCC, that define EMC standards. Then it's uh, national laws tasks uh, to regulate the compliance with national and international standards. Um, for sure, Every electric device must comply with the standards adopted by law and uh, all electronic products that don't have their emissions measured and within the limits uh, are illegal by law. So this is something mandatory for all electrical and electronic equipment that are connected to the grid. Um, we can divide the big world of the electromagnetic uh, compatibility in uh, two classes, EMS, that is electromagnetic susceptibility, and uh, EMI, that is electromagnetic interference. Susceptibility or immunity is the property of uh, an equipment to be immune uh, to the noise coming, let's say, from the external world. Uh, even here, we can divide in radiated and conducted. Instead, uh, EMI, so interference, um, it's the emission that an electrical or electronic equipment can have towards the external world. Uh, even here, we can divide in radiated and conducted. Uh, conducted noise, the, the definition of, of a conducted and radiated noise is really simple. Conducted, it means that the noise is carried uh, through uh, a wire, a cable, or a PCB trace. PCB trace. Um, it can be divided in common mode when the noise appears in the same direction on the two conductors but also in differential mode or also known as normal mode when the noise appears in the opposite direction on the two conductors. Instead, radiated noise is uh, mm, the unwanted electromagnetic energy that is radiated through space, so not through a cable, from and to an electronic system. Uh, we have a source, usually, and a victim. Source and victim act as radio antennas the source emits the wave, which propagates across the space in between and is received by the final victim. If we talk about different standards, um, we, if we talk about uh, conducted noise, conducted and radiated, of course, radiated is the really high, um, is the really high frequency uh, range. Uh, if we talk about conducted, uh, it's uh, the, the frequency range is below uh, 
the radiated one, but uh, even here, if we take into consideration, for example, uh, the EU regulation, we are in a quite high range from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. For the US, uh, the lower limit is uh, above, so it's 450 kilohertz. Um, but there is work in progress, for example, in EU to decrease the low limit to 10 uh, kilohertz. Uh, anyway, this is uh, quite uh, high frequency. It's important to know that if we uh, manage to uh, decrease the conducted noise in this area or in this area, we could also have advantages for uh, the radiated one or the radiated range. Um, the typical uh, process is to uh, measure the, the waveform through a spectrum analyzer. Uh, you can see here in the slide, we have two different waveforms. The first one on the left uh, is, uh, um, is the one that, uh, uh, let's say, a, a general equipment can have without uh, any filter. In this example, you can see here that we are above, above the limits that uh, is uh, uh, described here by the red uh, line and the pink line for the quasi-peak and the average limit in the low frequency range, so from, let's say, 150 kilohertz to 1 megahertz, the um, task of IEMI filter is to attenuate this noise below the limit um, that is here uh, described in the right image of this slide. This is one topic. The other one is that if we think about uh, the waveform that is coming from uh, our grid, in this case, you see 230 volt AC for the European market. Uh, you think that it's something that is a great and clean uh, sinusoidal wave to our final uh, uh, application that in this case is a, uh, is a washing machine. Instead, uh, in reality, the situation uh, could be uh, really different in the sense that uh, the sinusoidal wave is not so clean. You can see the noise on it, and, but there could also be problems with high peak voltage. In this case, you can see a lightning strike that could damage the final application. So um, why do we need to have EMI filters on our applications? First of all, because the electric equipment uh, must to be compliant with national and international regulations. So every equipment that is sold must be uh, certified by an external laboratory uh, to be compliant with uh, <laughs> the law adopted um, there. Uh, then uh, another task is to reduce the conducted emission to external mains. So um, the application must not emit uh, <laughs> above a, a certain level. Then to increase the conducted immunity against transient coming from mains. And finally, not to, not to forget, is to protect the equipment from high voltage pulses coming from mains. How can we filter the noise? Uh, there are two, let's say, uh, we have two different ways uh, that usually are used together in EMF filters. The first one is to put uh, an impedance in series with main for the uh, high impedance for high frequencies. The other one is to put uh, a low impedance uh, towards, let's say, ground for the, for the, um, a low impedance for the low frequencies. So uh, first of all, we must to be sure. Uh, so we, have, we use capacitors and, and inductors or chokes. Um, for the, um, we must be sure that for uh, the waveform of the power coming from the grid, so 50 and 60 hertz, uh, the supply wave should not be attenuated, but the high frequency noise should, because as I showed you in the previous slide, the, the noise is situated at, at higher frequencies. Uh, but uh, we are lucky because capacitors have a high impedance at low frequencies. So uh, at low frequencies, there is no uh, nothing or really small amount of stuff passing through here. Uh, on the other hand, inductors 
have a uh, low impedance at low, at low frequencies. So the 50, 60 hertz wave passes through here in both directions. Uh, instead for higher frequencies, we have a, uh, a decrease of the impedance here. Uh, so we, the noise is guided to ground. On the other hand, we have an increase of the impedance here. Uh, so the noise is blocked from passing to the application and on the, on, and on the other hand to, to the grid. This is a typical scheme of an EMI filter uh, using chokes and, uh, and capacitors. So let's start speaking about uh, EMI capacitors. Um, this is a common uh, scheme with X capacitor, uh, X capacitors put uh, between phase and phase and phase and neutral. Instead, the Y capacitors put with, between phase and ground. The task of uh, an X capacitor is to filter differential noise. Instead, Y capacitors are used to filter common mode noise. There are standards that define how uh, this capacitor uh, must uh, perform. Um, so um, there are different tests that are described at, that must be uh, fulfilled by this kind of capacitor. So we have two big classes, X and Y, and we have different subclasses. The most known are X2, X1 for the X capacitors and Y2 and Y1 for the Y uh, capacitors. Uh, this, as you can see here, these standards are EI, the ENIC for the European market, for example, or the UL6038414 uh, for the uh, American market. Uh, what is the difference uh, between the different subclasses? Uh, first of all, um, as I told you before, we have different tests. Uh, the most important one probably is the peak inputs uh, test. Um, different classes and subclasses have different values for the peak voltage. X2, for example, 2.5 kilovolt, Y2, for example, 5 kilovolt. Here is how this input voltage test must be done according to the, to the standard. So uh, this value here depends on the class of the capacitor. The length is standardized. Uh, a capacitor uh, pass this test if we find three consecutive pulses that are detected without no self-filling breakdowns or flashover of the, of the capacitor. Please consider that we have different uh, voltage levels for the different classes. Another really important test for the X and Y capacitor is this one, the endurance test. Here capacitors are tested uh, for 1000 hour uh, at upper category temperature with AC voltage on. Uh, and this kind of pulse is applied once per hour. Also here, as you can see, the, uh, U, uh, the U1 level uh, depends on the class of the capacitor we are uh, we are testing. So uh, for x for a, an x capacitor, this is the value. For a y capacitor, this is the value. As you can see also here, for y capacitors, this test uh, is more uh, severe than what x, x capacitor. Why in general for y capacitor we have higher peaks, higher voltage level that are defined by the standards. Uh, because of this, what happens if uh, an X or a Y capacitor fails? Here you can see the X capacitors. Uh, in case of failure, we can blow a fuse, but another, let's say, not so well result could be fire. Of course, we don't want to have fire on our dish, this wash, uh, washing machine. That's why the, there are uh, standards, and that's why uh, the, the requirements that uh, uh, these capacitors must have are quite, uh, let's say, high level. For wet capacitors, instead, if we have a short circuit here, you can see that we have the power on, the, on, the, on this line. We have that power from the grid is connected to the ground of our uh, appliance. In this kind, the, the ground is the chassis of the washing machine. So in this, ca in this case, there could be a big uh, safety problem for the final user 
there could be so, an electrical shock. Of course, we don't want to, <laughs> to have an electrical shock if we touch our washing machine. Uh, so that's why usually wet capacitors have more uh, stringent uh, requirements than X capacitors. Another important topic, if we talk about TMI capacitors and specifically for film capacitors is the harsh environment uh, or uh, temperature humidity bias test or also called THB test. Uh, in fact, if we speak about film capacitors, uh, the life of this kind of capacitors is really affected by the environment where the capacitor uh, works. Uh, more in detail, high, high temperature, but uh, high, overall high humidity uh, are not good friends of, this, of these components. That is why um, we have an IC standard uh, part that defines different grade and different test conditions for this kind of capacitors. Um, the most, uh, let's say, the, the highest uh, uh, in, in class is the grade 3B, that is 85, 85, 1000 hour. In this case, it means that this, uh, uh, if we have a grade 3B uh, capacitor, it uh, must withstand uh, an 85 degree uh, test with 85% of relative humidity for 1000 hour at the rated voltage. Um, we define, uh, we have a standard that defines these classes uh, because, uh, uh, as I told you, uh, humidity could be a big problem for uh, film capacitors in general. Um, why? Because we can have different phenomena, uh, as for example, the corona effect or corona discharge. This effect is uh, temperature and pressure dependent um, and start at a certain inception voltage that is not a fixed parameters, a fixed parameter, but depends on temperature, pressure, and humidity overall. For example, here, here we have our, our nice uh, X capacitor. We have a voltage, a uh, nice uh, waveform, uh, sinusoidal waveform on the circuit. We have the voltage across the capacitor itself. If this voltage is above the inception voltage, we could, could have um, a corona effect uh, and a partial discharge of the capacitor. So we won't see a clean waveform, but we will see something like that. Uh, physically speaking, in reality, what happens is that uh, we have uh, partial discharges of this electrode uh, especially here on the edge, because here the electrical field is higher. Uh, so we have uh, um, we have a kind of discharge of sparks from here to the opposite terminal. With time, uh, every time we have a, a similar phenomenon, we have a, a portion of the metallization here that evaporates. So with time, we have a decrease uh, of the metallization um, length in this direction. And we have a decrease of the active area of the uh, capacitor itself. So from here, we have an active area that is like this. Here, it's re reduced. If we have less active area in the capacitor, it means that we have less capacitance. Another uh, phenomenon that we can have is the electrochemical corrosion. Uh, this, uh, so we have reactions in the electrochemical cells, cells that are driven by the applied voltage. The corrosion rate that we see is directly proportional to that temperature humidity bias. Uh, as you can see here, here you have your metallization, your electrode. This is a picture taken from above. Um, if we have this kind of corrosion phenomenon, uh, we see that uh, uh, there are uh, parts where there is metal and other parts where, the, where there is no metal at all. If there is no metal, uh, there is no uh, exposed area. And even here we have, uh, we have uh, um, a capacitance, the, um, we, we lose capacitance. Here we have um, a comparison of two uh, chemic parts. Uh, we compare the standard X2 R46, uh, R46 uh, capacitor uh, with an FX62. This is a, 
um, capacitor, an X2 capacitor uh, specifically designed for Russian environment. This is a THP test 8585, 1000 hour. Here we have uh, on, the, um, on the left part, on the left graph, we have the, the decrease of capacitance of the two parts. The first one, uh, here we see an, the X2 standard, here the F862. We see that for the standard capacitor that is not built to work in harsh environment, in humid environment, we have a really quick drop of the capacitance value up to many 20% in uh, uh, 250 hours, so let's say 10 days. Instead, here the, we have a slight uh, decrease, but it's, uh, the slope is not so, is not so big. Uh, you can see here that we have um, you know, minus four, six percent in 2000 hours. Um, a degradation of the performance can be seen also on the dissipation factor here. The X2 standard, we see a, a quick increase of dissipation factor after just some hours. Instead for the FX62, we see that uh, this increase is really low. So this is uh, in theory, but what, happen, what happens in our application in case of EMI filter? Uh, as I told you before, attenuation of noise at a specific frequency requires the, impedance, requires the impedance of a capacitor to be low. Uh, but if we have a, the capacitance decrease over time, the impedance will become higher. Consequently, the EMI energy that enters and leaves our filter will, be, uh, will increase. It means that our filter will start uh, work in a, uh, in a worse way, uh, not uh, uh, like at the beginning of the life. Nevertheless, we have a higher uh, dissipation factor with time. It means that uh, um, the circuit can withstand less ripple current. If the filter can, with, the filter can withstand le less, less ripple current, uh, it means that we will have uh, an increase of the temperature of these capacitors with, uh, uh, if, and if the component, component temperature will go up, uh, we will have also a decrease of the life estimation of, uh, uh, of the filter. Um, this is a typical EMF filter, but uh, we know for sure that text to capacitors or capacitors can also be used in serious to main applications. So in capacity power supply, uh, this is, let's say, um, uh, let's say a circuit strategy to be the really really low low cost power supply. Um, in this case, if we have uh, a lower capacitance, uh, we have an increase of the of the impedance and a reduction of the AC current here. But if we have a reduction of this the AC current here, we also have a reduction of the DC current and uh, a reduction of the voltage across the final load. But if the voltage will be below the, let's say the minimum voltage for the working of this load here, it means that uh, the, the circuit will stop working. So uh, here a drop of capacitance so should be avoided. And uh, in this case, uh, heavy duty capacitors with THP tests must be uh, are mandatory, must be selected. Because here uh, we have that the final application will stop working. Here, if you are lucky, we just have a, um, a, a performance that will degradate. But even here, if the performance will degradate a lot, we could also have a failure of the filter. So it's important to select the right component. Um, there are two main, te main technologies for EMI capacitors, film and ceramic. Here, the choice really depends on the, uh, on the final uh, application. And uh, it's, uh, let's say it's the designer to, cho to choose. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, film capacitors, first of all, have self-filling. That is a really good property they have. Uh, then they have uh, of, they offer um, higher capacitance value, and they offer a really stable capacitance in this special factor across the whole temperature range. Instead, film cap in, in, instead ceramic capacitors are cheaper, and this is of course a really good quality. Are cheaper than film capacitors, and they. In general, they have higher pulse uh, strength compared to field capacitors. This is what we have in the Kemet uh, Yageo. Uh, this table is valid for film capacitors. Uh, I really like it because you can have uh, at um, in a, just one slide, you can have an overview of what we can offer. 
as you can see here, we have the different classes, X2, X1, Y2, Y1, different classes and subclasses. Here we have the different uh, voltage level, capacitance, the different temperature. You can see here if the component is automotive or not. And finally, here you can see what is the, uh, the, the if the component is suggested for rush environment, as for example, R52, and what is the uh, grade test we apply. Uh, finally, you can see if the part can be used in series with main for capacitive power supply. Uh, in uh, Kemet uh, Yageo, we also offer ceramic uh, EMI capacitors. Even here, we have different series, uh, uh, C700, C900, e ER series, different uh, classes and different voltage levels. I just want to underline here that we just launched uh, one or two years ago an SMD series that is 250 volt AC rated X1, Y2, X2, uh, or X2 uh, class. Okay, so uh, just uh, start speaking about the other uh, the other part of the uh, let's say of components that can be used in these applications. So uh, magnetics, uh, chokes. What is the difference between a differential and a common mode? First of all, differential we only see. Uh, a single wire that is wound to the to the core, so we only have two pins. Uh, so regardless the current direction, uh, the noise will be filtered uh, into magnetic energy and heat. Uh, usually, the normal mode noise is present at lower frequency ranges than common mode noise, but is not limited to common mode choke. Instead, you will see that there are two wires that are wound to the core. Uh, if uh, current is flowing from different directions, like this, the magnetic flux uh, is cancelled out, so there is no impedance. This is valid for uh, the 50 and 60 volt waveform, so we have no impedance at that, uh, at, at that frequency, but it's also valid for differential noise. In, this case, in that case, the impedance will be really low. Uh, instead, if the current is in the same direction, so direction, so if we speak about common mode noise, there is magnetic flux that is generated, converted to heat, and so we have an impedance that attenuates noise at mid and high frequencies on both the lines. Um, of course, uh, if we speak about uh, inductance, uh, we don't have uh, an ideal world, so the typical scheme uh, a co of a coil, uh, we have um, a parallel of an inductance, a capacitance, parasitic capacitance, and a parasitic resistance. Uh, usually, the, induct the inductance and the resistance uh, result from the ma material property of the magnetic material of the core. Instead, the C component, the capacitance, is due to, flo to the floating capacitance between the wind winding start and the winding end of the of the, um, of the winding element. Uh, if we have a look at the impedance graph, uh, here we, you can see that there is an area that is dominated by the, the inductance. Then here there, is, there will be a self resonant frequency where the impedance uh, generated by uh, the inductance is equal to the impedance generated by the, um, the capacitance. And then here we will have an area that is dominated by the floating capacitance, so by a parasitic capacitance. Uh, the formula of an inductance uh, uh, depends on uh, different parameters. The first one is the core material and the permeability. So this VR, of course, uh, higher it is, uh, higher uh, we will have an higher uh, inductance. But it also depends on the geometry, the cross-section area of the core, and the air gap if exists. So the cross-sectional area, AC, the magnetic uh, path length, LM, but also the air gap, LG. Finally, it also depends uh, on uh, the number of tones by, uh, so the square of the number of tones. So we have different parameters that we can, uh, we can play with to build our inductance. Uh, but uh, you can see that these are not fixed. Uh, if we take into consideration, uh, for example, at uh, first glance, the magnetic material, the, um, the magnetic permeability of the materials is not fixed. It means that it depends on temperature, uh, first of all. 
uh, as you can see here, uh, we have a graph of, of all the manganese zinc material we can offer as CAMET. Uh, we have really performing material as, for example, S18H or S15H, but their property, uh, magnetic property, is valid up to a certain temperature that is called Curie point. Above this point, the material is not magnetic anymore. So, uh, um, in your application, for example, if you uh, are working in an automotive application where the maximum temperature is 150 degrees, of course, you won't choose this kind of material because here there won't be any uh, permeability uh, left. Um, but you will choose other kinds of materials, as for example, the 7HT or 5HT that are specific for high temperature, even if they have lower uh, permeability uh, constant. Uh, the um, behavior of a material, it also depends on the frequency. Um, Camet in general, we have a uh, different kind of materials. If you look at the manganese zinc ferrite, we have different uh, materials inside this big class. Um, Magnetic permeability is quite good, but as you can see here, the frequency range is not so high. So this, uh, uh, we have a higher noise suppression effects in the lower frequency range. If we have, if we have some noise here in the higher uh, frequency range, we have to choose another kind of material. In this case, it is nickel zinc that um, is more efficient at higher frequencies, even if the permeability of this material is quite poor. Another option could be the nanocrystalline that has a really wide frequency range and really high magnetic permeability. So it seems to be the perfect material, but as I will show you in the next slide, it's not, um, it's not like that. Uh, of course, we also have the automotive version with the T, with the final T on the material. Um, in fact, in this case, I have an example here. We have a common ball choke. Um, so we have a core um, with uh, a definite, def, definite uh, with a specific, uh, sorry, with a specific shape and uh, dimension. And we have the same number of turns, same kind of wire with the same thickness. We just uh, selected different core materials. Uh, as you can see in this graph, uh, if we compare the values uh, we can see on the data sheet, it seems that non-crystalline material is really, really good and uh, really above the other kind of uh, materials uh, we have here. But if we consider its behavior, uh, when we apply a common mode current, for example, 250 milliamp, we can see that the behavior of the non-crystalline goes behind the other materials. So nanocrystalline is really good, but even here it depends on the, on the application because at the higher currents, uh, the advantages of this choice are not uh, so big compared to uh, other material. Anyway, it really depends on the application. Um, here I have um, another example that uh, uh, we have um, a definite, a specific uh, core shape and size, same number of uh, uh, turns and same wire uh, diameter. Uh, we can see that if we uh, change, in this case, uh, we just use uh, manganese zinc material. If we change the material uh, of the core and we go from a lower permeability to a higher permeability, we have an advantage uh, uh, on the inductance and so uh, uh, consequently also on the impedance of the of the choke. However, if we go to uh, to look at high fre higher frequencies, we can see that this advantage there is not anymore because this area here is dominated by the floating capacitance. So um, it's not that one material is better than the other. It really depends on the application. Here instead we have another example. Uh, we we use the same uh, same in choke, uh, same material. Uh, here we just change the wire type, so number of turns and uh, the wire thickness. Of course, if we have uh, the larger the diameter of the wire, the larger the current capability of the choke. 
uh, but the larger the wire, the less number of turns we, we can have uh, around the core. So we will have for sure less inductance and the lower frequency range. So there is always a trade-off between current frequency and inductance. It's interesting to, 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 to notice here that if we increase the number of turns, we have a big advantage in, on the impedance. Of course, the wire will be, uh, will be thinner. It means less current capability, but uh, this is also here, this is only valid for uh, low frequency to the, to the peak. Instead here, also here, the floating capacitance is, uh, let's say, dominating and uh, we have a similar behavior uh, for all the kind of uh, winding uh, turns we, we used. Um, but how can we um, how can we improve the behavior of the capacity of the inductor at higher frequencies? Uh, one of the let's say typical uh, method is to use divided winding instead of a divided winding. So we just modify the winding structure we use in the core, as you can see here for a toroidal shape with same size, same diameter, same length of the wire. We have um, with the divided winding, we have a, uh, we have a small capacitance, so we have a better behavior uh, for the high frequency. The same uh, aspect is valid also here for a gear coil. In Kemet, we our uh, choke portfolio is really, I may say, impressive, really, really big. Uh, we have different materials, we have different shapes. If we talk about, for example, industrial choke, we go from 0 0.1 amp to 40 amp, then we can make, um, of course, custom shapes with higher, uh, with higher performances in terms of current. Uh, we have two phase, three and four phase, 250, 400 volt AC. Finally, uh, I divided, let's say, the big word of the chokes in differential and common mode. Actually, uh, we could also be, build uh, uh, chokes that have a good behavior for both. In this case, uh, uh, you can see here, uh, we have a conventional SS series from uh, Kemet Geo portfolio. Uh, we just modified the shape of the core, adding these uh, two uh, protrusions here. Uh, doing this, we created our SSHB series um, that uh, if we have a look at the magnetic flux density, we have a, a flux density like this that works for the common mode, but adding those two uh, protrusions, we also have differential um, magnetic flux density for the differential mode here in these local areas. Um, if we look at the inductance, differential mode inductance, just adding these two protrusions, uh, we have an increase of the inductance that uh, converts in, into an increase of the, of the impedance. So what are the key takeaways of this webinar? So uh, first of all, uh, each electrical equipment must work in its uh, good, in its electromagnetic environment. There are uh, national and international regulations that must be follow, followed that, that, and that are adopted by law by the other, by the single nations. Um, to comply with these regulations and to build uh, uh, robust equipment, EMF filters are used. Uh, usually uh, X and Y capacitors and chokes are used. X and Y capacitors are built to withstand different levels of stress that are defined by the different standards. Um, their behavior strongly depends on the environment and can degrade with time. So here the right components must be selected and uh, for sure the, humid, uh, the humidity of the environment must be taken into, into consideration. Uh, for chokes there can be uh, differential common mode or dual mode chokes. Uh, even here, the behavior depends on the core material and the winding method, but also frequency, current, and temperature are important. So also here, direct component must be selected. Thank you. Thank you, Attilio, for the great presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, 
uh, received uh, one question in the Q&A section so far. So this is a good sign. So the presentation was very clear. Uh, the, the question is, uh, is there any inactive uh, incentive to filter the 60 Hertz components in the mains in the EMI filter? Or is there any passive placed on the mains to target the 60 Hertz wave to filter to compensate shape or something like that? Uh, I don't know if I understood well the questions. Uh, anyway, the I think the I answered here. Of course, we we want to have the power coming from mains going into the equipment uh, here. So the fifty and sixty hertz waveform should not be attenuated but we should attenuate the higher frequency noise. But um, because, for example, uh, this is the, um, if we take into consideration, for example, uh, the chokes, this is the typical, uh, the typical impedance uh, wave of a choke. As you can see here for the low frequency range, impedance is really, is really low. So uh, the, low frequency parts of the 50 and 60 hertz just bypass the inductance. Instead, we have an increase of the impedance for the higher frequency and that part is filtered. On the contrary, the same is valid also for, uh, for, um, for, for the capacitor. So uh, for the, uh, the, the impedance shape of a capacitor is, do, is, uh, is reverse. It means that for uh, low frequency, we have really high, uh, really high impedance value, but uh, uh, the capacitor is put in parallel. So uh, the, let's say the waveform is not uh, guided to ground. Instead, if we go to higher frequencies, we have <clears throat> a decrease of the impedance. So the noise is guided to ground by the capacitor. I hope I answered. Yeah, I hope this is satisfying the customer. Uh, this next one is about the presentation. So we will publish the presentation and the uh, recording of it a few days after the, this webinar is done. Uh, is there any change from capacitance and 400 Hertz? Is the next question. Is there any change of the capacitance at 400? At, at 400 Hertz. Uh, no, the capacitance, uh, uh, if, we, uh, if we consider film and ceramic capacitance, the capacitance value itself is uh, stable across frequencies, so we don't see a change of the capacitance. We just see a change of the impedance. However, uh, however the impedance at, uh, um, if we consider 400 Hertz, uh, we are still in the low frequency range, so that kind of wave are just uh, bypassed. Uh, uh, it's a low frequency range if we consider, uh, yeah. So noise is usually at higher frequencies. Great. So the next question is, is there any simulation software before actual design? So I think here we can Maybe they can use our case in simulation tool about the, the the simulation part of the before designing the, the capacitors. Yeah, they use KC. They can use KC uh, uh, for the film capacitors. There is also a live calculator for the for some uh, X and Y series where they can calculate the life of the capacitor according to the environment where the capacitor is put. And if I speak about the environment, I don't consider, I don't just consider the, um, the the temperature and the voltage, but also the humidity level of the environment. I think that is really useful for film capacitors in general, but uh, um, specifically also for uh, X and Y film capacitors. Right. Another question is: uh, Is the noise frequency dependent on the switching frequency of the device? Yeah. For sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next question is: uh, Many common mode chokes are customized, although there are already some standard parts. Uh, do we have? Do you have any idea how much percentage is standard parts 
I'm guessing up, opposed to the, the customized part. I think the biggest majority is uh, standard party, but it, it, it depends. It depends. So, uh, for example, as I told you in Kemet, our portfolio is quite big. Of course, if you look, uh, if you go to higher, higher, let's say the, the small um, power uh, chokes uh, area, so uh, lower current, uh, if we talk about uh, some, uh, uh, let's say from 0 0.1 uh, amp to uh, dozens of amp, uh, is uh, is uh, is an area where you can find uh, custom where you can find standard uh, parts series. If you go above uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with power, so above with uh, with current, probably that area is more related to custom parts. Yeah. Right. So this is uh, related to the previous questions about the frequency and switching frequency. Uh, so is the noise uh, noise frequency same as the switching frequency and if not how are they related but it depends uh, yeah it's they are related they are related of course uh, but it really depends on the on the circuit it really depends on the on the switching uh, circuit uh, they they use what is uh, what there is also between the switching circuit uh, and uh, and the uh, EMI filter. So it really depends on the application, it really depends on the circuit. It's a too general uh, question. Yeah, yeah. Also here, I think it's the same case. If we do not have the area available, add only a choke coil, is it enough to reduce common mode? Uh, here, uh, also here, it depends on the, yeah. it, it depends on, on, the, um, on the application because it depends uh, how far you are from the level that are required, and uh, so it's it really depends on what you <laughs> what uh, what uh, what is your noise level and what is your circuit. Okay, so uh, I think this is the, all the time that we have for this webinar. All the unanswered questions will be answered after after this session. Thank you very much for attending the webinar and thank you Antilio for the great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.